Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Guarcino. I'm the president and CEO of Visit Philadelphia. And welcome to BPHL Innovation Fest. So glad that you're able to join us. What an incredible schedule it has been. A great kickoff yesterday, a really big morning, and we're going to end the day with uh, Pitbull at 5 o'clock, uh, moderated by Jennifer Rodriguez, the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce President and CEO. So I am uh, really thrilled that you were able to spend some time with us today for everything that you thought you knew about travel, because it all just changed. And in fact, this presentation has changed as well from the first time that we were in, uh, invited to be a part of it. We were going to talk initially all about Gen Z and how their, their innovation and that uh, generation will shape the future. But with COVID and the global disruption in the travel industry, of course, we had to talk about everything that's happening in the world of travel. And I am so honored to be joined by my very, very, very good friends, Julie Coker, president and CEO of San Diego Tourism Authority, and Greg Karen, the new president and CEO of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. You have the heavy hitters in travel and tourism today with you for the hour. We are going to go through uh, the hour relatively quickly. Um, we're gonna break it down into four segments. We're gonna kind of level set and get everyone on the same page with a quick introduction and a, and a round robin. And then we're gonna talk about COVID, of course, on the impact on the industry and in travel. And we'll go a little deeper into some of the issues that are there. And then we'll go into innovation and Gen Z and taking a look at the future and how your travel experience will absolutely change moving forward. We're gonna take your questions too. So I hope that right about 1.30, we'll start to take your questions. Make sure you put it into the chat box and we'd like to hear from you and anything that you wanna know from this distinguished uh, panel that we have here today. Um, I also do wanna invite you to take a look at the chat box. You can see the bios for um, Julie Coker. Um, from San Diego, and you can check out her organization, as well as Greg Karen from the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Visit Philadelphia, of course. So let's just kick it right off. And so instead of a, a normal introduction as we would normally do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of kick this off a little bit differently, so I hope I don't throw you off, Julie and Greg, but um, Julie, let's kick it off this way. D describe your February, right? Like, what was February like? What were you talking about? What, what were you, what were the discussions in travel and tourism and certainly in San Diego? And then take us through how March and COVID and going in today has kind of forced your, your company and your business to quickly innovate. Thanks, Greg. And certainly uh, it's great to see Greg and Jeff and, and Jeff, uh, it's great to see the background and certainly Philadelphia and all the great things and certainly miss everyone there. So. You're absolutely right. When I think back to February, uh, you know, for example, at, at that time, I was the president and CEO of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. And we were actually planning and ready to execute a um, an overseas visit to London and Paris to promote the exhibit that would have taken place uh, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Whitney in New York. So we were all steam ahead with international visitation, and certainly Philadelphia had a very full uh, convention calendar. And so uh, March, we were able to do that visit and certainly uh, had a very successful press conference in both London and Paris to promote uh, the Jasper Johns exhibit that was to take place. And next thing you know, you come back and, and interestingly enough, when I was in Paris with Fred Dixon, who you know, literally the first confirmed case of COVID was confirmed in New York. And that was like March 1st. And here we are, you know, so many months later. And, and like everyone, obviously just devastated about the number of lives that have lost. But at the same time, we've really had to pivot and focus on our industry and our, our, our staff members that are out of work and, and certainly the hundreds and tens of thousands of jobs that have been lost due to COVID for hospitality and tourism. I joined San Diego here in June of this year. And, you know, what an interesting time to move across the coast. Um, it's, I still haven't met all of my staff in person because obviously we are going to safely reopen our offices here. 
But I think that, you know, where we are now is, is we're just really, and I know none of us want to say the new normal, but it's reality. We're all readjusting. Um, certainly some great things have come out of it uh, here as well as Philadelphia. Our hotels open for leisure visits in June of 2000, uh, June 12th. And uh, many of our 440 attractions were able to reopen safely. We still have Legoland and some other amusement parks that are not yet open, um, but certainly the miles and miles of gorgeous beaches are here and available to our leisure customers. Um, and, I, and I just think like everyone, you know, our San Diegans have been welcoming and certainly adjusting to their new lifestyle uh, and, and just making sure that we're all safe. And, and like many destinations, we have a safe traveler's pledge here where we're talking about, you know, the training of the hospitality staff that we've done, but then also too, what we expect visitors to do when they come visit San Diego. So needless to say, in my 30 plus career, this has been uh, one of the most interesting, uncertain, emotionally probably draining times, but at the same time, I'm hopeful because I know that we're a resilient um, industry and I know that we'll come back. Uh, and when I see friends like you and Greg on the screen, it makes it even uh, better because I know that there are better days ahead. So Greg, so Greg Greater, Greater Philadelphia has Philadelphia just announced 46 million people came to the Greater Philadelphia region spending $7 billion. We have um, the industry basically stopped in March. And here you are, the new president and CEO of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, which is responsible for booking and the Pennsylvania Convention Center, big meetings and convents and overseas travel, like Julie mentioned, Paris and France. And here you were had a long established career in convention centers around the country. And we were lucky enough to convince you to take this great job at the Philadelphia Convention mm -hmm. Visitors Bureau. So as the new president and CEO, talk to us about what your February was like and how the organization has been pivoting as meetings and conventions are indefinitely suspended sure well first of all great to be with you all on the split screen and uh obviously julie and i have been living somewhat parallel lives and somewhere under the desk here i've got a baton that she passed me i didn't realize there was an explosive buried inside of it but um <laughs> been working for a long time to try and diffuse it just like everybody else so so go back to february it was a kinder gentler time wasn't it it would seem like uh years if not decades ago and of course, in Julie's case, you know, she she knew and had announced where she was going, had her mindset, was already doing the the, the planning to pack and move cross country. Uh, for me, Jeff, to your point, I was still with a company called ASM Global, which of course manages the convention center here in Philadelphia and about you know 90 others around the world. And so I was I was running my parallel secret life, of course, of, of applying for this position. And um, Julie, you will remember it as soon as I say it. You know, it was a kinder, gentler time. We were just the other side of City Hall over my shoulder and met at a place that it's hard to be inconspicuous. We had a, a late afternoon cocktail atop the Bellevue, uh, which is really a, a wonderful place, except when you don't want to run into people. And of course, everybody that we probably shouldn't have run into that day, we did. Um, but given my former role, it was it was a plausible meeting for Julie and I. Um, and as Julie said, we were talking about wonderful things and great outlooks ahead both for our own careers and for our respective destinations, uh, San Diego and Philadelphia. Um, so it is an interesting place to be. And it was interesting that, you know, along with the Zoom-a-thon, as I call it, that we were getting into in my former role, also became uh, just a part of my own process. You know, and imagine, you know, going through the process of interviewing for any new position and and having COVID start that as well. It start, and, and needing to go for a two interview process, both of which were on Zoom. So you're not really able to connect as personally as you'd like to in, in that kind of environment. But at the end of the day, it really kind of, um, to use your opening words, Jeff, it was it was a level set. It was a, all right, we're in the business of needing to adapt and adjust. And you know we're into a world where we've had to adapt and adjust in a bigger way than we ever needed to before. So Julie and I were communicating you know, quite a bit as we went through that process and trying to do the handoff in a natural way. And as, as Julie said, I'm, I'm in an organization now and uh, my running joke as I got things started was that I went from a, a private company that was just going to make, unfortunately, a lot less money than it used to make to go work for a nonprofit organization that's going to make no money whatsoever, um, you know, during the early days of the shutdown and work in an office that I can't go to and lead a team that I can't see in person. So what could go wrong?
Um, <laughs> you know, it. it <laughs> um, but as I say, it it really does get you thinking, and you and you get very very adept at adjusting and realizing. You know, what are the priorities, both personally for a new career and professionally in terms of engaging with you know, a staff and stakeholders and partners and boards of directors and city council members and everybody else that you really you know, would want to get to face to face and, and, and trying to do so in a way that was still meaningful and, and trying to get to know people. And to your point, Jeff, about meetings and conventions, I guess, you know, we've all learned to readjust um, and, and adjust our schedules, but it's interesting that the very tools that we're using, I think in the long term, will, will, will augment our industry. And we're going to talk about that, I think, through this conversation. Mm -hmm. So they've served as a stopgap. But I think they've proven more than anything, and I'll say from the outset that uh, it's it's really not the way to go. It's 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 a, a tool to be used to augment what we do. Um, but but just to get into it, I mean, the, the toughest part, as as Jeff and Julie and I have all shared, is is what this indi what this industry has really gone through. And I think we'll probably get into that mm -hmm. conversation pretty quickly. And when you think about the industry, the hospitality industry and the global travel industry is a complex one. You have meetings and conventions people who go for big sporting events and competitions, it's certainly a different kind of travel. People who just travel for leisure or for fun, like in Philadelphia and would visit Philadelphia markets too. And then you have people who take cruise vacations and then you look at the airport and the airport and it's, it's lift and connectivity to Europe. And our Philadelphia International Airport also was good about to have yet a record year. And all of a sudden flights to Europe stopped. And then there was the funneling uh, airports into the United States, and then the airlines stopped flying to as many cities as we could possibly have, and and the visitor center shut down, and the Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell, people could not come to visit, a major driver of one of the reasons that people come to Philadelphia. Restaurants shut down, the product started, all the reasons to visit. Uh, Julie has beaches in San Diego. They did not shut down, but people were a little afraid to go to beaches, because was that a place where you could get coronavirus, et cetera. So the industry, complex, all really interconnected, and for the first time in all of our careers globally, is at a sustained uh, standstill, and one that could go forward or go backwards, right, in terms of COVID and, and lockdowns and, and, and public health. So let's get into um, a couple other, now that we've level set about the industry and travelers, um, I'd really like to talk, we've already got a question, but uh, let's talk about how really has COVID impacted in the short term and let's say the next, let's say through 2021 in, in meetings and conventions and, and then leisure tourism. Julie, let's kick it back to you. I mean, we had thought this was three months. Now tell me about what the rest of your 2020 looks like and what you think 2021 looks like in San Diego. And then I'll kick that same question off to Greg. Sure. So, you know, in, in 2019, for example, we welcomed 35 million visitors and those visitors contributed 11.6 billion in visitor spend. And, uh, you know, as we look at 2020, you know, we had a, a record breaking January and February was fantastic. And then, of course, like everyone, you know, March kind of fell off the floor. Um, so what we're concerned about, certainly through the balance of this calendar year, are the lack of meetings that we'll be able to hold. So whether that's a hotel meeting or whether that's a citywide convention at the convention center, we know those will not take place through the balance of 2020. So right now, like most destinations, we're very reliant on leisure business. Um, and as you said, Jeff, we're, we're very fortunate to have, you know, miles and miles of fantastic beaches um, a very laid back atmosphere here in San Diego, which certainly lends itself to a drive market of just around 50 million. So we're fortunate in San Diego because we can tap into Las Vegas, we can tap into Arizona, we can tap into other parts of California for them to come and visit and, and enjoy San Diego. And we're gonna be very reliant on those folks through the balance of this calendar year. At the same time, we're not fooled or um, misled by the fact that everyone else is looking to poach, if you will, that same customer, right? So we're all going after that leisure customer. Uh, the majority of San Diego's business travel really is more convention related. Uh, we have done a fantastic job with life sciences here. 
Um, but right now, as we both know, or all of us know, that the business travel has, has somewhat subsided and will probably subside through the end of the balance year. When I turn my eyes to 2021, while I'm still concerned about the first quarter, especially as it relates to conventions and meetings, and of course, uh, just like Philadelphia International Travel, I am hopeful that, like everyone else, that there will be a vaccine that will certainly help uh, spark and I'll say inspire travel. Um, we do have a very full calendar for the back half of the year for conventions and meetings, trade shows, uh, and so we're hopeful that we'll be able to resume that. And Greg, how do you see meetings and conventions and, and sporting events and overseas travels for the rest of 2020 and into 21? So uh, first of all, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's not lost on me how I used to introduce myself in my former role leading uh, convention centers like our Pennsylvania Convention Center. Um, when we would make presentations or when I would about you know what the role of a convention center is and its function as an economic engine for any community. Um, I used to always use as my opening line, why convention centers are built? Well, tens of thousands of jobs, I used to say, would rise and fall based on the activity inside that convention center. They're built to drive jobs and drive de uh, development of hotels and, and restaurants and all the services that, that um, uh, live off of and feed off of, not just meetings and conventions, but the, the all aspects of tourism and hospitality. And you know, it, it used to be more of a sort of an introductory line to people to understand why convention centers are built to lose money. And it was really just more about the impacts of the center on an economy. And it was always hard, um, or it was often hard at both uh, city, county, state level around the country, sort of have people understand that, that paradigm. Well, people understand it very clearly now. Um, the impacts of the, that opening line that I used to use about jobs that would rise and fall was really meant to talk about peaks and valleys in our industry, right? A citywide convention is in town. People get flooded in the streets and, and go to our attractions and museums and restaurants. And all of a sudden that stopped. And so we no longer had peaks and valleys. We just had one really deep and extended valley. Um, it's really a canyon is what it is when you think about it, the analogy. Um, so I was stricken like most of us in, in leadership, both in tourism and all the related industries, that out of the close to 200,000 hospitality related jobs in the five county region, um, at the peak, we lost 58% of those jobs. Every one of those people was, hey, this, these are life sustaining careers and we all talk about the hotel industry and related careers that really provide ladders of success for people. Um, and even after some rebounding, we've still got probably between 35 and 40% of our hospitality related jobs are, are still you know, out of work and waiting for us to reopen. So that is a, is a driver for me. If you think about the impacts from the meeting and convention side, uh, we lost about 518 meetings and conventions, which would have brought 560,000 visitors to Philadelphia. So that's that's the backstory to what I started with, and that is that's that's the impact that we're now feeling. So to be forward looking, and again, I've, I've tried to keep myself and our team really focused on the mid to long term because I think that any of us that gets mired in today um, is just doomed for failure. So we've got to look a little bit beyond it. We've got to understand, to Julie's point that you know, we are waiting for a vaccine, we are waiting for people to feel like they can travel and feel no differently about COVID than they feel about the flu. That's pretty much a given. And we've got you know, great uh, input from our medical community on that. So what we're trying to do is, is focus on retaining what we can, uh, but same, same as in San Diego. I mean, a lot of our major events, they're pretty much all off the books, of course, for this year. And this year is rolling pretty quickly into first and second quarter of next year. You know, I think, you know, Jeff, you'll probably talk about it. Leisure Tourism certainly has a more of a short term opportunity. But for citywide conventions, it's very difficult for a meeting planner or an association to think about, you know, bringing together three, five, ten thousand people and who will actually show up. So our biggest job right now is, is moving events to the tail end of next year and into future years to make sure that the strides that um, Julie and before her Jack and before Jack Tom had built up this extraordinary growth year over year for decades. Um, we have to not lose that stride and just consider this this little cavern a, a hiccup. Um, and we'll look at ourselves as evil Knievel trying to jump over the cavern and uh, the canyon to to reboot the industry. And you really mentioned the, the impact, not only just on the jobs, which is devastating for our family and friends who we all know who work in the hospitality industry. The city's budget is down about 350 million from tourism related taxes that uh, tourists would pay on sales tax and and different taxes while they're here and and all the small businesses that you mentioned going out to a restaurant 
uh, the shops, uh, transportation, Uber, taxis, the, the meeting planners and small businesses who help those conventions uh, sell AV. It really has a major ripple effect through the economy. And, and, and the early projections of the entire industry is that even if there's a, a vaccine, we're looking at 2024, 2025, really before the robustness of the tourism economy comes back in all its segments based upon people. Right. How do you feel about traveling? How does Julie feel about traveling? People who are attending uh, BPHL Innovation Fest, how do we feel about checking into a hotel for the first time? How about that airplane ride when someone's maybe in the middle seat or not in the middle seat? And as we uh, look to travel with family and friends, what are those indicators that say what I'm really what am I comfortable doing and how much money do I want to spend? So really for all of us, everything in travel has has really changed. And for those of us who travel, Greg, I know you've done some meetings in, in DC about how a business meeting will can change and to be a safe business meeting, going to the airport where there's a lot of facial recognition now that uh, will help you in less contact as you get onto the plane and, and all the cleaning. I think probably our industry is probably the cleanest industry <laughs> there might be right now if you check into a hotel or, or, or to a restaurant. But uh, let's change the question because we're talking about a lot of negative things that have happened, but you know, changes and challenges can bring giant opportunity, and this is a very resilient industry. So I'm curious, uh, Julie, let's kick it back over to you. What 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 opportunities are are you talking about? Is California tourism talking about, or some innovations that are coming through as a result of COVID, and just the change in the travelers? Definitely. So, you know, last year the organization was able to really expand its footprint in terms of marketing, was able to actually launch a national uh, media program. And certainly we would love to continue that this year, but really like most destinations, we've turned inward. So we've looked to San Diegans to, uh, you know, re-explore uh, San Diego and, and really become, you know, a tourist again. So uh, we've reached out to our local community and one asked them to support our local businesses so, um, you know, we, we talk a lot, uh, all of us do, about stay vacation, whether it's stay Diego, dine Diego, shop Diego, um, but more importantly, just support San Diego. So that's something that we haven't had to do in the past, uh, and certainly that has worked. We realize right now that customers and, and travelers are unsure of whether they want to travel, but I agree with you. I think that they are the safest and cleanest that they've ever been. But also, too, it's given us a great opportunity to work with our members on how they uh, present their products virtually. Um, obviously, you know, virtual sites are, are extremely important right now and just overall virtual experiences. And, and I think, you know, Greg said it best is that we've always, especially in the meetings and convention industry, have talked about how technology could possibly uh, reshape a meeting, but again, face-to-face -face is always going to be there. I think that that's our, uh, you know, kind of natural ability to, to bond with one another, but certainly technology has helped with that. And so um, how we've been able to work with our members to help them enhance uh, their, their visual and virtual products that they have online and how they reach their customers. We too have done the same thing. We've done a number of virtual sites and done different versions of them. I don't think it's any longer acceptable just to show folks pictures. Um, when I moved to San Diego, they were not doing, let's say, tours of the apartment. So, you know, I got on a call with the with the salesperson and we did a FaceTime and he walked me through the apartment and I was hook, line and sinker and, and signed a lease before I even walked into the building. But I knew everything about it and that was because it was an enhanced experience. So I would say, the best thing about this COVID uh, situation is one, families have come together two, and spent more time together, but also two, I think the technology has really stepped up and has shown us that it can be a friend. And again, as, as Greg said, it can certainly augment any experience and it's no different here in, in California. And Greg, um, as the primary marketing uh, agency, the Pennsylvania Convention Center, there's been a lot of enhancements that have been done there that will uh, change the, the meeting experience for the positive there. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the short term? And then uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the meeting that you went to as a business traveler in D.C.? 
Sure, it, it was actually through U.S. Travel Association, which Julie and I now you know, both, uh, uh, funny enough, serve on the board for U.S. Travel. And um, I, number one, uh, that was literally the first meeting at the Grand Hyatt in downtown D.C. and probably one of the first meetings of any kind in, in the region. And like a lot of what we're seeing now, it was actually set up as what's now being branded as a hybrid meeting. Uh, so Julie attended virtually as she is with us today, and we were texting each other uh, while we were on a Zoom call. But it was really fascinating to see, and, and, and to your point, Jeff, um, really all aspects of our industry have risen, and men, most of them were already there. Uh, again, we, we've, we've known for years, those of us in the industry, that of course, you know, airplane air is actually more like hospital air than anything else. So the airplanes were actually the ones that were most likely already there, and it was more about the touch points in an airplane that needed to be dealt with in the air quality. Um, the Hyatt and USTA and the, and, and, and the, the audiovisual company that was there, you know, did everything exactly right down to every speaker change that went up to the podium in the room. They changed the, the cover on the microphone um, and everything was wiped down every time. Hyatt did its usual job and, and had a great flair for the food and beverage, but it was done, you know, in, in, in nice packaging and individually served by servers um, sort of station style. Um, but I, I felt that it was imperative to go, especially, you know, there were a number of people who did fly in, and that was pretty early on. That was back in uh, June or July, that, that early July that that meeting occurred. And I thought we needed to show support for the industry, and certainly it's an easy drive from Philadelphia to D.C. Um, but I, I think what we're finding, and, and, and back to the convention center here, um, yeah, ASM Global has put together this program called Venue Shield, and all the big hotel companies have put together their own branded versions and, and series of expertise and validations of what they're doing. Um, anybody that stayed in a hotel is already seeing a lot of the changes made, a lot of the individual items taken out of rooms and plastic bags around remote controls and housekeeping service by stay as opposed to by day. Um, so everybody's been adapting uh, very quickly and very well. And I think that you know the immediate term was to create a literally safe environment so that people were not taking chances that were traveling. But more importantly, it was giving us all the opportunity to go out and tell people what we're doing so that when the doors start to open up and when the the vaccine is coming out, you know, there's there's a race to get back to market amongst all the major markets around the country. And I think our mission here has been to make sure that we're not just creating the story to tell, but we're telling that story to our meeting planners, convention organizers, and everybody else. And I think it's just, you know, every opportunity creates a chance to reposition yourself and reevaluate how you present yourself, but also what you do. Um, so now it's about highlighting our assets a little bit differently. You know, everybody knows Philadelphia is a great walking city. It's very well suited for social distancing because there is so much to do uh, in and around not just the convention center and in Center City and Old City and, and South Philly. Um, we, we've got this natural um, habitat for people to walk around and enjoy a, a very historic, culturally rich city. And to think about how we're, you know, we're, we're selling it through drones. I know a lot of the museums, and I think the art museum here had used um, video walkthroughs of exhibits to keep people engaged. You know, it, it is fascinating to see how people are using technology to promote. But as we talked on our prep call yesterday, and Julie said, you, you can't you can't use a drone to feel sand around your feet, and you can't use uh, a, a video conference to create um, the engagement that you get at a at a meeting or a trade show. Uh, so we're going out and retelling our story, and not only do we have a great story to tell as a city and as a region because of that walkability and the mural art programs and all the other benefits, but we go back to our roots of how we've always sold Philadelphia as a media and convention destination. And again, you go back 10, 20 years ago, we were the, the stepchild between New York and D.C., and of course, all my predecessors have proven that's no longer the case. You know, we hosted the Pope, we hosted the RNC, the DNC, the NFL draft, all these great events that proved that we were no longer just that redheaded stepchild, but we were a major market to be contended with. And when you look now at our proximity to those other major markets, and we hear about tourism experts like U.S. Travel and others saying that travel and meetings and conventions are going to come back in concentric circles regionally, well, that's our sweet spot. So it's now up to us to go back to our roots. And we always talked about how we sit in the middle of this drive market and more population than anyone else in the country and and be happy to be in between New York and DC because that could be our, our, our salvation in the near term to book more corporate meetings and smaller events and then ramp up again to the citywide conventions that we've been successful with in the past. And that leads nicely and it's almost 1.30. We, uh, thanks for the questions which are coming through. We certainly do uh, encourage questions because we will switch up how we're uh, doing the the conversation and um, partly one of the questions comes in is 
uh, what kind of traveling are we doing now as tourism experts? And maybe I'll kick this off because if you turn on the news every night, leisure travelers, people who are looking for fun and getaways and getting together with family and friends, we're traveling. We're, we're back out on the road. We're doing drive trips. We're taking uh, even longer trips, maybe jumping in the car, going five, even 10 hours. But people are, people are out there looking for activities to do. And so I would say, let me just ask two quick round robin questions to you. Uh, Julie, what's the last trip you took and why during COVID? Did we lose Julie's audio? I moved, uh, permanently here. So I was in Philadelphia. I also have been to Jacksonville, Florida, and I drove to Palm Springs. And actually on Friday, I am flying to Park City, Utah. So what I would say to the audience, and I know that you both agree, is you just got to get out there, right? You've got to, and, and I would also say um, you have to plan, right? So you know, take the the leap of faith and take the next step to actually grab your calendar, plan a trip, and then go through with it. Uh, you know, I, I think definitely, uh, obviously, traveling safely is, is important. So I had my mask, I washed my hands, I did physical distancing, and, you know, it was a great experience. Um, so I, I would say to everyone, you just got to get out there and do it. Uh, but I've done both drive and and flight, and and it's fine. It really is. Greg, last last trip you took during COVID and why? Um, so I mentioned the first one, and that was my that that over one overnight trip to DC, which was eerie because that was still pretty early on, and we were literally the only people in that hotel. And and anybody in the industry will laugh when I say that the ratio of hotel management to meeting attendees was literally one to one, because again, we were not only a high end industry event, but we were a guinea pig for that Hyatt in DC to test out their plans for food and beverage and our rooms operations and and even down to your valet car think about that you know putting plastic bags over your steering wheel things you wouldn't have thought about before but if somebody's getting in and out of your car to park it for you another detail it's got to be covered to julie's point you just got to plan i'm sorry jeff my, my last trip was um that combination of you know family obligation turned into a mini vacation um i have the luxury of having a daughter who works in dc as well as one that is goes to school in dc and even though her school is uh, gone completely virtual early on. They were smart enough to do so. Uh, we didn't. We signed a lease for an apartment. She's got a bubble to live in, and we didn't think it was appropriate to force her to sit in her childhood bedroom and take junior year college classes. So we drove her down, and we expanded what would have normally been a one or two night. You know, moving into her college apartment, seeing my other daughter, getting together for a meal, to four or five night vacation. Why not? Nation's capital. There's plenty to do. Um, to the planning in advance thing. Think about the things that you do at home. My wife and I were thinking in advance and talked about, you know, takeout. We, we really were not going out to restaurants aside from an outdoor here or there and, you know, had planned in advance for either at my daughter's apartments or at our hotel to just do takeout from some of the great restaurants in D.C. and plan to bring those back to the hotel or to their apartments the same as we would at home. So it, there may be a little bit of a uh, sort of an, a fear factor, not a fear, but a, a hesitation. If you just think about when you're traveling, every element of what you're doing while you're now at home you're gonna be golden because the hoteliers have us covered, the airlines have us covered, everybody's got us covered, and it just takes a little bit more thought. Pack some extra masks and think about how you're gonna get fed and where you're gonna bring your meals. Things are starting to open up in, in some markets just like here where uh, a little bit of indoor dining is available again. Um, but that, that local vacation or regional vacation should not be ignored or avoided. Uh, there's plenty to do in our, in our own region uh, that you should take advantage of. Great. We're gonna. I'm gonna ask you to define based upon another question we received. So these next two are gonna be based upon questions we're receiving. And the first, I'm gonna ask you to define it. What the question I'm asking, and then we're gonna skip into uh, Gen Z and innovation. Um, and I'll, Julie, I'll kick that off with you. But so one of the questions we have is, what does innovation mean to you? And so I would say innovation means to me courageously thinking differently, followed by action. So courageously thinking differently followed by action is innovation to me. Greg, innovation, how do you define it? Innovation to me is just basically finding a way to do something or doing something you've never done before. That's my simple explanation. Julie, innovation, how do you define it? Um, definitely everything that you've said in terms of different change transformation. I read something the other day that said innovation is crucial to the continuing success 
of any organization and such a time as this, if that's definitely appropriate. So Julie, sticking with you, we have a question um, and I want this to kind of lead into Gen Z and to other populations and, and, and how tourism fits into the overall economy, both here in Philly and of course there in San Diego. But can you uh, compare the, the, the startup scene uh, in San Diego compared to Philadelphia? And how does that also relate into the types of meetings or conventions or travelers that you get there? I, I love, first of all, I love Philadelphia audience. We are all, you guys are always so competitive, right? So <laughs> of course I had better say that it doesn't compare at all. <laughs> uh, no, but truth be told, you know, San Diego, 70% of the businesses here are small businesses. So it really has been, and, and certainly I, I want to give a, a nod to our city council here and to Mayor Faulkner and, and to our county, because they have been an outstanding um, component and supporter of small businesses. I mean, from the day that I landed, every news story was about how we keep small businesses in San Diego employed, um, whether it be through hospitality and tourism or other industries. So. Um, definitely innovation and creativity is alive and well in San Diego. And some of, uh, you know, the, the greatest startups are, are similar to Philadelphia. They're tied to the outstanding uh, colleges and universities that we have here. Uh, and they're certainly doing some, some great, great work. So I, I will say to my Philadelphia friends that Philadelphia does a great job with startups, as does uh, San Diego, and, and certainly we know small businesses will lead the way for the U.S., and so kudos to both cities on, on that front. You know, on, yeah. when I think about innovation, uh, I think about every generation of travelers, whether it's boomers, Gen, Gen Z, I'm a Gen X, no one ever talks about us, they just skip right over to millennial, but <laughs> right. um, we're, we're, we're the overseen generation, but um, I think every generation of traveler travelers really do transform the travel industry in some way. You see us responding to it in experiences that are offered, uh, whether it's Expedia or how we promote a destination or how much internet speed is available in a hotel room or how many plugs are in a hotel room. Uh, I guess um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Greg. How are you seeing Gen Z uh, attendees to some meetings or sporting events, how, how are they behaving similarly or differently for the meeting planner than, uh, let's say, a boomer or a Gen Xer? So uh, I'll remind you, and Jeff, Julie, and I would make sure to go look up the definition of what a Gen Z uh, uh, makeup is. And it was defined uh, as the most diverse generation defined by their global, social, visual, and technological attributes. They're the most connected educated and sophisticated generation ever. All words that never applied to me or my generation, apparently. Um, so I think it's an interesting combination when you think about it, because we, we think about uh, the younger generation. I won't even use the, the brands that are that, you know, or the strata of generations, but younger generations are <laughs> tend to be associated with technology and technology to the point of isolation. You know, headsets on and, 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 and laptops, iPads, iPhones, whatever it was, um, and ingrained in that space. But really what it led to for Gen Z, I think, is um, that, go back to the Starbucks mentality, that you know, even if you are as plugged in as you're going to be, you wanna be plugged in around other people that are plugged in and, and to be able to interact with them in between and, and, and take your earphones out and have that human interaction. And I think that goes to the educated and sophisticated um, part of the definition of a Gen Zer. If you translate that mentality to meetings and conventions, you know, we see it, you know, again, with my former role, you know, we, we managed building out in San Francisco where they did all the, the, the tech sector events for uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google. And it was interesting because things that my generation would have seen as rude and disruptive in the past, i.e. an entire audience of attendees sitting on their iPhones and typing and tapping away while there's a speaker on the podium, um, what that really means is those people are engaged in social media and sharing what's going on at the event and maybe talking off to the side through Twitter or any of the other social media mechanisms to other people in that audience and or people that are connected to that audience outside of that venue. And what the tragedy of the current environment is for Gen Z is that because they are truly the youngest generation, people that are working and earning a living, and because mm -hmm. of the, the, the close downs and work from homes, they were the most severely impacted group because they truly were isolated. 
you know, there, there are people that are a lot of the younger people that have apartments here in, in Center City or in South Philadelphia or, or around the area that were forced to go home and maybe less likely to be married or have kids or, or, or too old to, to go home to their parents or too far to go home for their parents. So a lot of those folks that if you look closely in those Zoom calls with our own teams or our clients or, or other you know, community groups like this one, um, you've got you know, the, the, the 20 somethings that are sitting truly isolated. And that's, that's been traumatic uh, because as much as they like their technology, they like their human interaction too. And as much as they're impressed to see a, dro a, a, a drone video of some unique place, whether it's Philadelphia, San Diego, or, or Paris, they wanna be there and interact with that community and get the social elements. So I, I go back to my earlier statement, and that is that we've gotta get past this period, of course, we gotta get past the point of, um, of, of being uh, isolated and separated for our own safety and to take a lesson for Gen Zers especially because they're the upcoming generation. They're going to be not just the meeting attendees of the future, but the meeting planners of the future. They're gonna drive very specifically where events happen and how they happen. And in a positive way and back to innovation, if there are any positives that come out of this environment, it is that it's driven us to think about how we engage and, and layer in um, technology but still make this a human experience and one that an educated, sophisticated, curious generation is aspiring to go ex explore. And I agree with everything you're saying, Greg, and with what Julie's been mentioning, because our industry is very resilient. People want to travel. I think for the first time in, in really the history of our, of our industry, you have everyone from boomers to Gen Z, Gen, they want to travel. People want to be globally connected. They want to go out and have fun. They want to see that and experience the locals, uh, the authentic experiences that that you can have, or something that's that's truly special that you can't get somewhere else. And as Julie mentioned, and we do have a, a question on what Philadelphia is doing, um, we are all trying to get people to get back out and travel again. And our new campaign, mm -hmm. uh, our turn to tourist, is the campaign that was softly launched mid July to really reach out to people in the local five states to say jump in your car, you're not going on that cruise vacation. I was supposed to go to Europe twice this summer. I'm not doing that or could not do that. So what other trips could we take here in the United States? And, and we're asking people to choose greater Philadelphia and engaging restaurants and the, and the attractions who are doing amazing deals right now. It's an amazing time to travel. Your travel dollar will go farther. And every city is sort of packaging um, their experience. I could say, though, for people here, I'm very not only optimistic for our industry for a very, very strong rebound in a giant big way, because all of us do want to get back out and travel again. But greater Philadelphia will likely rebound quicker than some of our competitive sets. We have a strong leisure market, which is already uh, out there. And then, of course, meetings and conventions and international and Canada, Mexico, we, we will rebound. And I think, as Greg mentioned, we are looking at people who want to discover Philly. It was just the beginning of this year that National Geographic Travelers said we were on the, the 20 des 25 trips you have to take in 2020, the only city in the United States, the, the only destination in the United States with the exception of the Grand Canyon. Uh, but I say both places created by God, uh, Philadelphia and the Grand Canyon, so both worth the trip uh, to see this year. So I think that we will see travel come back in a big way. And one of the other questions that we have here is what it's gonna take to make people feel comfortable. What is it really truly gonna take to make, you know, Julie's mom comfortable, uh, the guys who are traveling on a, on a golf trip or maybe with your kids to a theme park. High level, you have to pick one thing, Julie, what's the one thing that would make you as a female executive traveler, what makes you feel most comfortable? What's the one thing so far since you said you've been traveling, what's made you feel comfortable traveling again? I really have to go back to what both both of our destinations are doing and that's educating the traveler, right? So I think the Safe Travelers Pledge is huge, uh, you know, reminding folks, and, and I like to say physical distancing as opposed to social distancing because we're all social, right? So keep your physical distance, but wearing your mask, and washing your hands and, and being outdoors as much as you can. I think really those things have uh, dispelled some rumors and myths and, and I think made folks more comfortable whether they're doing a business trip as Greg did or whether they're going on a leisure vacation. 
those basic elements still matter. The other thing that I'm going to point to is, is the outstanding work that I think both of our airports as well as our hotels have done in terms of training their staff and making sure that they are following safety and health protocols. I think all of that helps ease the traveler's mind. But more importantly, you know, as we've all said, you just got to get out there. You've got to start somewhere. Greg, as uh, you talked about taking your daughter to uh, her college trip, as, as, as a dude, what, what's the one thing that it, what's, makes you feel better traveling? You know, I, I, I go back to the, the words of uh, the, the doctors in charge, my fellow New Yorker, Dr. Fauci, and my fellow Philadelphian, Dr. David Nash, who heads up, who's our chief health advisor, doing everything that we can do to help communicate responsibly about traveling safely. You know, I feel more comfortable if I walk around and do see other people wearing masks. I do feel, as, as Dr. Fauci says and John McNichol at the convention center says, that if other people would think about me the way I think about them, uh, then that, that's kind of the humanitarian side of mm -hmm. how simple it would be if everybody would just wear a mask. And I think, Jeff, you mentioned it at the outset, Philadelphia is high on that list. And I'm going to continue to promote my, my new uh, catchphrase for Philadelphia, where the city of brotherly love, sisterly affection, and masquerly protection. Um, <laughs> and I'm waiting for it to catch on. I haven't trademarked it yet. But it, it, it's true. I mean, as, as much as, you know, it does tie to brotherly love because, you know, as you see more and more foot traffic out on Market Street right out my window, um, people are wearing masks everywhere. And I, if I walk, if I go somewhere where they're not, um, I feel uncomfortable. So I think we are, even though we're in the business we're in, we're no different than the rest of, of society. And that is a vaccine and a mask are probably in that order, the two best things to make us feel comfortable. So at the end of the day, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's about making sure that we don't only create a healthy and safe experience, because this isn't just short term. Uh, we're gonna get through COVID and there's still gonna be re results that last well into when meetings and travel are, are going back to whatever full bore looks like, but it also won't be the last pandemic. So we need to be prepared in such a way, communicate in such a way. And, and as, as Julie said, we have our PHL health pledge, the same as they have as one in San Diego. If we can not only create the environment, but communicate the environment that we've created, I think that that's what we look for as, as travelers ourselves and we need, what we need to impart on our, our, our business partners and on our customers. And, you know, answering the question, jumping in, um, slightly different. I've been, as a traveler who do tons of business and leisure traveler and as, as, as a, a gay traveler goes all over the world, um, I had to really think through what is it that is giving me pause to travel? What specifically is it in my, in my head? Is it the fear? Is it other people? Is it washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands? Is it, is it understanding, as Julie mentioned, education? And so I think part of it is, at least for me, has been spending some time with what are you really concerned about, right? Because when you think about traveling around the world or you think about traveling somewhere, you know, what what's the biggest concern that you have? And I think about other uh, pandemics and health issues that have happened. We all have, it all starts with education, right? What's the rumor? How do you get it? Uh, fear, and I think one of the things about travel is about how it makes you feel better when you do it. You get a chance to meet other people. You get a chance to relax. You get a chance to reconnect with your significant other or disconnect from your significant other. If that, you know, if you're doing everything from home, leave the kids. Um, so I think we stop to, you know, even being in the travel industry, you're, you're kind of balancing, balancing that. We um, have a lot of great, great questions from the audience. And I, I really appreciate that. I want to get ready to, um, wrap up in in some ways but um let's go this way do we think that zoom and virtual events as the world ha has it replaced in person um ha has the world really the world's changed <laughs> but has it changed that we're we're never going to meet again we're never going to have a convention we're we're never going to gay pride in san diego i mean is it really changed or how are we doing it What's going on? What no, do you think? I, look, I, I I go back and and again, you know, the, when we talk about Gen Zers, of course, they weren't they're not old enough to remember the advent of the internet, right? But I can remember <laughs> the day that Al the day that Al Gore invented the internet, as we all recall. I think it was a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> it was it was quick. And I'm joking, of course. That it was quick that people would start to question whether trade shows and conventions would be replaced by the internet. That look at this new tool that we've got. People can look at technical information and videos and specifications and photos of of products and services and 
it, it was going to be the death of the trade show industry. And this goes back probably 18 or 20 years ago when the mm -hmm. Internet and the web were really starting to sort of do the crossover from government and, and um, uh, educational sectors into the mainstream of both consumers and, and businesses. And what it really ended up being was it, it ended up being a huge layer of value added to the trade show. It was able it, it enabled uh, trade shows and exhibitors and suppliers to take what was really a three to five day event, you know, a widget convention and a trade show. For those three to five days, you had all buyers, all sellers in one place in the convention here, the Pennsylvania Convention Center, doing business. And then that was it until they would reconvene in a quarter or six months or more likely in another calendar year. And what happened was the Internet was was used as an add on now to extend the life of a trade show from just three to five days to 365 days. It enabled buyers and sellers to communicate both before and after the live trade show. But what we found through that sort of transition and holding our breath to see where the future would take us was it was such a huge value add that it actually helped and served as a boon to the trade show and convention sector. And I think that's what we're seeing now. I think that not only are we seeing that the, the internet and Zoom, or not the internet, but Zoom and the, the teams and the social media we're using today are there in an emergency scenario to uh, to backfill uh, the ability to get together. I think longer term, trade associations and corporations and trade shows and meeting planners will take this and use it more and more to access people that could never get to those conventions in the first place and to serve as an alternative revenue stream and an alternative option to connect people from multiple locations. Maybe you'll see conventions and, and some events that are become multi-locational where they're doing the same convention in six places around the world and using this technology that was always really there in the background. There's always satellite communications and things like that. But take that as a means to augment the environment that we're so used to. And I will say, um, like after 9-11, people just began to expect greater security, checking your bags, looking for, it became a part of the travel experience but people didn't stop traveling they just knew to get to the airport a little earlier and Absolutely. bring it one bag and by the way let's get back to uh our, our feet in the sand julie let me ask you uh this because we're going to wrap up uh soon this has been an amazing hour and, and panel and julie i, I want to say from all of us in philadelphia we're thinking about our friends in california with the wildfires we're watching mm -hmm. the station every single night on the news not only you're dealing with covid you're dealing with wildfires and humanitarian crisis at the same time. Of course, San Diego, of course, had that awful explosion as well. Uh, with our service members on the uh, brave service members on on the ship there. So we we do want to acknowledge that uh, California and San Diego, that you have your hands full even beyond COVID. And so know our thoughts and prayers and support from Philly, are right be right behind you. So I want to ask you uh, on a positive note. Uh, outdoor dining, is it going to stay? You're going to keep it? Like all these innovations that all of a sudden the restaurants, are, what, what are you going to keep after all this? So first of all, Jeff, thank you so much. You're absolutely right. You know, our hearts and prayers are, are with those that have lost their homes. And, you know, you, you, sometimes you think it can't get any worse. And, and to have the wildfires now and certainly, <laughs> uh, you know, kudos and, and much, much appreciation to our first responders and the great job that they're doing to keep Californians safe. Uh, we certainly do appreciate that. And I had the opportunity to be aboard the USS Midway the other day and celebrate 75 years. Uh, it's the, it was the longest operating ship in the 20th century. Uh, and the Admiral who was uh, who came to the ceremony actually had launched or, or flew off of the deck uh, back in 1985. So even though there is tragedy, there's always those great moments that as Americans, we get to kind of rally around. Um, real quick to, to, to Greg's point, the thing that I'll say about, you know, virtual is, let's face it, you guys know that I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And although we lost, I got to tell you, watching that game and certainly hearing the noise was okay and we're dealing with it, but there's going to be nothing like going back to the link and all of these other great stadiums and, and experience them in them in person. So virtual has its place, but it, it'll definitely repl not replace that in-person live experience. Um, you know, in, in terms of outdoor dining, I'm, I'm fortunate. I found a great location. I'm in Little Italy here in San Diego, right outside my door. We have outdoor dining. 
And the great thing about it is, is that San Diegans, and I'm sure Philadelphians are probably going to say the same is, hey, let's cut down on some of this vehicle tra traffic. You know, let's try and do this on a more ongoing basis. I know that San Diego is definitely looking at that. I, I will make a little bit of dig. We do have great weather, guys, 365 days a year. Just saying, um, we, we only have about 10 days a year where there's rain, so we never really have to worry about umbrellas and things like that. But anyway, um, definitely, I think the outdoor dining experience has really just brought us all closer together. You know, think of the Budokan table, it's outside, so you're having dinner across from someone who you may not know and you have the opportunity to get to know them. You've got your children outside that are playing with other children, of course, with masks on and safely. Uh, but I definitely think outdoor dining is is here to stay. It's it's a completely different experience, and and for all of us, it's I just think it's like taking that little barbecue you did outside in your own backyard and putting it in the middle of Market Street or whatever street is more productive for us to get to know each other better. So I, I think we can keep this going for a lot longer. Well, thank you, Julie Coker, President and CEO of San Diego Tourism Authority. Greg Karen. Good friend, president and CEO of Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. You two are, are friends. I admire you. You are heavy hitters in the industry. And I want to just say what an amazing, amazing hour. A couple things just as we wrap up. First and foremost, um, everyone can be a part of continuing the conversation. Follow us on social media. If you have additional questions, we're always happy to answer. Book a trip. Quickest thing you could do is book a trip. Go somewhere fun, post it on social media, tell some friends and family, wear your mask, uh, travel responsibly, but all of us could be a part of it. And also share your innovation ideas. If you stay at a hotel, if you go to an attraction, share your feedback, fill out that survey. The hospitality industry is definitely listening. You might be one of the next big ideas that I might see on Shark Tank and uh, with Mark Cuban and make a, a bunch of money. I do want to thank uh, BPHL Innovation Festival, to the staff, to all the sponsors, to the amazing people behind the scene. What an incredible festival, 5,000 people plus. Don't forget Pitbull today at 5 o'clock and all the great sessions this afternoon. Um, I want to thank Independence and Susan Jacobson from the Greater uh, Philadelphia uh, Chamber of Commerce and Dan Hill, the, the entire crew who spends so much time putting on this amazing innovation festival. So on behalf of Greg and Julie and the entire hospitality industry, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest in the BPHL Innovation Festival. And I'll see you at the next session. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, guys. It was great seeing you. Stay classy, you. San Diego. Thank you. <laughs>